That's great, thank you very much. Okay, this is session five. What we're looking at is efficient building supply. So this is an introduction to H4.0 and the online material which is available within the project. We're looking at passive house techniques in more detail than we did last week. And then as usual, there'll be a Q&A at the end. Next slide, please. Same presenter as last week. Again, I've known Barry, I think now for about 12 years, very, very highly regarded, um, has a very strong background, recently got his PhD, which was specifically about uh, monitoring indoor radon concentrations, but he's also very involved in passive housing. Um, a very good presenter and very accessible, and I think you'll enjoy today's presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, background. As I've said before, it's an Interreg Northwest Europe project. Now, this is not only a housing project, but we're also looking at trying to promote H4.0 building techniques. So what we're looking at is adapting and applying digital technologies using low carbon materials. So it's not just the energy efficiency of the building, once it's constructed, we're taking it back to the beginning, which is what goes into the building, what are the materials. Um, three CEA are responsible within this project for developing an H4.0 benchmark. And then we're also looking at suitable designs for better quality of life. Next slide, please. As I've said lots of times before, um, these are all of the partners. So you can see we've got partners Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, Ireland. Um, Barry, who's presenting today, is from Southwest College, who are based up in Enniskillen and Oma in Northern Ireland. Um, we've also got um, OSL, which is the platform deliverer. They gave a presentation three weeks ago. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, for the Irish end of things, we should be building housing units in Wexford, Carlow and Kilkenny. For various reasons, Wexford have had to suspend the development of those houses. They're changing the whole layout, they're densifying their site, so they will not be proceeding. But Carlo and Kilkenny are now on site. They're a little bit behind schedule, again, for various reasons, but both of them should be complete by the end of this year. And just as of this week, there will be an extension to this project this project should terminate this summer, but it will be extended out to March of next year to allow us and all of the other project partners to complete. So the houses in Carlow and Kilkenny will be complete within this project um, due to an extension of time, which is fantastic for us. So what we're trying to do within the overall project is save carbon emissions and also save costs. Next slide, please. The objectives, H4.0, NZ, which is near low, nearly zero energy uh, buildings. We're looking at the passive house approach, and that is very much what Barry's talking about today. We've had a presentation already on the platform from OSL, which is a, a platform that we're developing within the project which is to help people at the design stage, both to consider the layout to optimize energy efficiency and the, the products themselves. We've already had a presentation on material and building technology from our partners in Austria. And then there will also be some work done within the business model and a business model implementation within the project. Next slide, please. Okay, you'll be glad to hear this last, last slide from me. We'll then be moving on to Barry. Again, just to, to emphasize, we're looking at both embodied and the, the energy which buildings consume um, and the emissions as they consume. So if you've already put tons of concrete into the ground and you've constructed with concrete block or concrete, you've already embedded so much carbon into the building that it's impossible to save that by over the, the period's life. So we're looking at the passive house approach, but we're also looking at the low carbon first fabric approach, which is 
what are the materials that you are using to try and help solve the problem before you embed a lot of carbon dioxide into the building construction. Okay, that's the end of me. I'm now gonna hand you over to Barry. He'll be presenting for approximately 30 minutes. There's then about 15 minutes of Q&A, and I would encourage you to put questions into the chat line and we'll pick them up at the end. Thank you very much, Barry, it's over to you, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll just put on my video, which I just realized isn't on, there we go. Um, Okay, yeah, so uh, I think there is a lot of people who were on last week, so this should make even more um, logical um, sense with, with regards to progression from one um, session into the other. So we'll kick off um, last week, just to, by way of recapping, um, I spoke uh, in, in particular about passive housing and, you know, the, uh, did, did put a lot of emphasis on the fabric first approach through five principles, if, if you recall. And this session now sort of builds on that and talks then specifically if, if, if you're embracing that progressive approach of um, low carbon, uh, or sorry, yeah, um, fabric first approach with the five principles, then everything else that, that we're talking about today it is a good dovetail or fit to, to that. Um, I don't know if something's not moving, hold on, okay. So yeah, Michael's already given an overview of, of the Housing 4.0 project um, and, and it's on that. And of course, I, I suppose the, the, the slides have um, all of this in it so that in case they're delivered in isolation, but of course the climate change imperative is the reason why we have to reduce both operational carbon and embodied carbon. Um, and when we're looking at that, uh, you know, just, just to recap again as well, if you're talking around 30 to 39, 40% overall energy and, and emissions from building, you're, you're talking a 27 or, or, a, or an 11% split is typically what's talked about between operational and embodied carbon. Um, and again, you, you know, just, just looking at the science of climate change, I, I spoke about this last week, and I, again, I, I'll make that point again, where, you know, our, our outdoor air quality, um, you know, is measured with regards to CO2 per parts per million, and we're, we're just over 400 parts per million, which is, you know, really, really stark. And, and it's, it's um, the, the reason we're all here, the reason we're trying to build better um, for a better tomorrow, really. Um, yeah, so I'll give a, a little bit of an overview of that as well, just as I was talking there about the 40% consumption and the 36-38% CO2 um, from buildings. So one of the things that's that's really, really, um, you know, co coming into its own, and, and rightly so, is this other, um, you know, bit that has not been talked about for such a significant period of time. Um, operational energy has been the focus and indeed the narrative of all of my career um, to date in the construction sector, you, you know, going back to, um, you know, the early noughties, um, it, it, this was very much the focus. This was where the first EU directive came from with the building energy ratings and, and you know, the progress that has been made with respect to that. Um, and, and now we feel that, you, you know, the, the solutions around um, the operational energy are, are probably sufficient enough, uh, although I don't believe they're widespread enough. Um, and now, you know, the, the embodied carbon is really coming in to consolidate what has been done on operational energy. Um, and again, we're looking at the metrics there as well. So the, the 2030 targets, um, you know, will dictate that, you know, if building a new building, there will be a, a significant emphasis on body carbon and, and the whole idea would be to get to below um, you, you know, ideally 600 uh, kilograms of CO2 um, for, for the buildings. So, uh, and again, on the slides, we'll, we'll distribute these afterwards and you'll have those um, for your own sort of digestion. Um, yeah, so, so again, th this slide does just give an overview of, of what we've seen here as well. And, and it, it sort of articulates it in a way, you know, where we're going and, and where the term, you know, net zero and, and near zero energy buildings is all coming from. Um, it, it's a bit of a rabbit hole to discuss all parts of near zero, net zero, uh, all of this here. And, and you could do a half an hour session um, on clearing all of that up itself. So, I mean, um, I, I'll stay loose on that. And again, I'm happy to pick that up in the discussion 
a lot of my um, approach to presenting is really to, you, you know, inform, particularly in a, in a short session like this, a, a number of areas, and, and hopefully it, it does generate a healthy discussion. Um, so as we've seen here in the yellow, the low energy use is really what I was focusing on last week. And then, um, you know, th this week we look at, at, again, we're just touching on the embodied carbon. It, it's been covered in previous sessions. And, and now we'll, we'll look at the low carbon supply or the supply chain feeding into that. And, and by the end of this session, we'll have covered off each, each element of that. Um, so yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, and again, this is just giving a little bit of an overview of what's out there with respect to um, the directives on what's coming. And again, on this chart, we can see where we're wanting to go and, and where we are potentially going in, in many ways with with um, the use of fossil fuels falling more and more and more, um, with again an increase in, in low carbon technologies. The, the thing that I'm very precious about is that we get this combination right, that, that we do have significantly or, or efficient enough housing um, before we put in these, these heating technologies. And the ones that we're going to look at today are, are really as follows, uh, heat pumps, um, they're very familiar to us here in Ireland. Indeed, many people say that Ireland's the most suitable country in, in, in all the world almost um, for heat pumps because we have this cool, temperate climate all year round. Um, we could make a joke about that and just say that it's consistently rubbish weather all year round. Um, but, but it is true that without having extremes either side, it does, does help the performance of heat pumps. Um, so we, we look at that in a little bit more detail. Uh, infrared heating is another technology, again, maybe not so common here in Ireland, but across this particular project, we have very, very small, um, let's call it micro housing with our Flemish partner and indeed with our partners from Almira um, in, in Holland, just outside Amsterdam. And for those houses, it's very possible to, to because there's such a low energy demand, to provide the heating or, or have an element of the heating from infrared heating. So that's that's why that's included um, into the accession. Biomass heating is another one that we're quite familiar with here uh, on the island of Ireland as well. So we'll, we'll do a brief bit on that. And then uh, solar heating, both PV and um, the solar thermal, which is a le less in vogue at the moment, but we, we can discuss that when we get that far. Um, and then we're talking some of the micro generation and battery storage around that as well. So the first technology that we, we've sort of um, highlighted, you know, in the supply chain that, that, that's very relevant is, of course, uh, air source heat pumps in particular. There are, there are other types of heat pump technologies, but we feel that this is the most common of, of the individual heat pumps. So um, I, again, there's no um, audio with this. I'm just going to talk over it as it's there. So again, the heat pump has a unit that typically will sit outside. Um, it's fuel, if you want to call it at a basic level, is, is the outdoor air. And um, because it does stay quite stable most of the year round, it, it, it's quite suitable um, for this. And I used the analogy last week about a, um, a kitchen and a, a, a heat pump practically being in reverse um, to cool your fridge. And, and this works the exact same way with the house. Providing, of course, you have a good enough building envelope and fabric, you will get um, the heat pump working in, in, in an optimal way in which it will move on to the next slide. And then take it um, so, yeah, just to continue on heat pumps before I hit the infrared one, um, we, we have this situation where, as I said, the, the building fabric and, and the energy efficiency is the key thing in making that heat pump work. Here at the Crest Centre, uh, as part of South West College's estates, where I'm based, um, it would be very, very common that we would have got cold calls, different visitors at events and everything. And a very, very common experience is, is people asking me why their energy, energy bills are not what they thought they were going to be following the installation of a heat pump. And, and the common denominator in that would typically be that the building fabric, you know, isn't appropriate for that technology. So again, that, that's one of the things. The other thing that was in that little video was again, the emitters of, of the heat. So because it's a low grade heat technology, it works really, really well with underfloor heating. And because it gives you know, heat into that slab situation, 
it, it does mean that there's a, a low steady heat in the house as well. So it, 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 it's a little bit different than the performance that you would get from a boiler, which is able to respond with, with, a, with a high heat, high heat output very, very quickly. The, the secret with the heat pump, it, it, it provide, it, it, there's a little bit of understanding required with it where it, it'll just give a low steady heat all the year round. And indeed it's, it's quite a healthy um, heat and environment with that. So, so that's the air source heat pump. A um, little bit out of sequence there with that, um, but the infrared heating now we'll, we'll have a look at on the video. So as I said, it's it's not as common here at all. Um, we do have it used in isolation, like in in labs and different school settings. We would have seen it in the past for um, you, you know that type of direct radiation heating. So you can see here in in the video the the common you know, the traditional type of radiator, and again with that we're getting. And uh, you, you know the type of heat distribution is through convection uh, and the air, and then here we can see the, the infrared panel, and with that then we're getting you know direct radiation um, coming off the panel and indeed you know heating that space. And um, the one experience that we've had in the project to date around this is that uh, again a small room and micro housing situation it does fit in very well with rather than you know being a, a substitute for you know, the typical Irish house. Um, what, one of the other things that this project has revealed, and I, I suppose we all maybe knew within the project partnership that in Ireland and the UK, homes would be a significantly larger than lots of parts of, of, of Europe um, with regards to footage and, and footprint of the housing. So with that, um, you know, does come this, this little bit of a, a variance as well when choosing heating solutions. Um, again, sorry, so again, so well, back to one that's much more common for us, and again, it is the the wood fuel biomass. Um, you know, the biomass stove with a back boiler. Uh, again, it's it's the entry level, if you like, in terms of you know de decoupling yourselves from fossil fuels, um, on that ladder and, and substituting uh, maybe maybe a traditional. Um, open fire in a house and, and taking that first step on, on the energy efficiency ladder would be to put in a stove and particularly if it is a back boiler you, you get increased efficiencies and um, the, the, the terminology or the efficiencies around that would usually be that an open fire would only be 30% efficient which um, you, you know when you hear that out loud and understand it appropriately it, it's, it's so shocking to be burning fuel in a fire but only getting 30% of the heat yet 70% going up the chimney. Um, so if if we do put in a stove in a home, it, instantly what happens is a complete reversal there. You get 70% of the heat and you only lose 30%. And I, and I think it's fair to say with the back boiler in combination there, the efficiency is even better than that. So the, 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 this is a very common um, transition, particularly in rural Ireland as well. Um, so we'll, we'll have a look at the video here as well and I'll do a bit of a talk over while we're going through it. Um, again, just looking at the home, it, it can be wood chip, it can be pellets as well with some of these, um, you know, boiler solutions um, or, or indeed it could be, you know, the direct replacement to a chimney um, where you have the stove put into the chimney spot. I, I, either of these combinations all work. But as you can see there in the diagram, you've got um, it, it, it it contributing to the, the hot water demand of the house and indeed also the heat output of the house. And, and when we look at maybe things like passive houses, again, these solutions are not off the table, particularly in a rural setting where there is maybe, um, you know, st stuff on a farm um, in, in terms of fuel or, or the possibility to grow a small acreage and be self-sufficient with regards to fuel. It, it can be quite an eloquent solution to things. So again, in a passive house or a really low energy house, um, what, what you might be looking at here is um, have, have, you know, adopting one of these biomass um, heating solutions. Um, and one of the reasons why they're quite appropriate, again, to, to, to that, is if you recall last week, I said that um, the heating demand is the metric that's used in the passive house standard. Uh, and again, it's used in the low end, the, the NZEB approach as well, but indirectly. So, so what, what, what I really want to focus on here is exactly these numbers. Passive house is 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum as a heating demand. 
And the rule of thumb is that the domestic hot water demand is double the heating demand in a passive house. Um, so, and then, in, in, and I talked last week about that as well, that the NZ numbers are actually made up in, in a quite similar way. So again, if you add 30 kilowatts, which is, you know, consistently a number that will come up for domestic hot water, and you add it to the 15 kilowatts, you get the 45 kilowatts, which is, is traditionally the, uh, the NZ number that's used in, in, in Ireland with, with you know, regards to meeting NZ. So um, where, where, where this really dovetails really well with the wood pure biomass is that if, if your hot water demand is double your heating demand, then the, it, it does work quite well with, with the, the biomass. Maybe I haven't convoluted that too much, <laughs> um, but I'm happy to pick it up in the, in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, I think this is the second from last video. So this is just talking about solar uh, heating systems. But, um, the first one here is the solar thermal. So solar PV is next. And, and again, I think you know, once we get that overview, that, that's, that's all of them covered. Um, in, in my mind here, this has been included um, by the following feedback from the project partners. But in, in, in my mind, in a lot of ways, solar thermal is, is sort of on the decline uh, in many ways as a solution, particularly in the Irish market, and has been surpassed by um, PV generation. So we have here, you know, when looking at solar thermal, the, it, it first of all started with the flat plate solar collectors, which we would have seen um, again in the early noughties, very common place. And then uh, in more recent times, this then was passed out or superseded by the evacuated tube collectors, which were the, the tube systems that you would have seen on the roofs. And again, you're talking, you know, maybe in the region of eight to 12 tubes, depending on the size of the tank that would be there. And again, you'd have a short circuit of, of glycol um, go, going around the, 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 the various tubes. And again, that would feed a circuit that would feed the hot water tank. Um, so it's a very, very simple technology. Uh, although in, in it, it has a couple of different circuits a couple of different parts uh, and PV, which I'm going to cover now in a moment, has a, a, a leg up on it now with respect to the evolution of this. So in, in the video here, we're going to see more or less a, a depiction of what I just described. Yeah, so you've got a sort of collector on the roof. It's the same with PV action. Um, and again, it, it's absorbing light uh, and heat from the sun. Um, it, it, will, it will heat up. Um, the glycol fuel uh, it, liquid, which would be in, in these solar thermal systems, which is a low boiling point, and then that, that heats, heats them a whole hot water circuit, which would go to your tank, um, and, and it works quite well. And again, th th this is another thing that can be combined with the previous system, which would be maybe your biofuel um, situation as well, where you can consistently have hot water Again, for some commercial applications, th this is a good solution or combination, like sporting clubs, for example, where you have the hot water um, already at a temperate temperature, and then you need to supplement it then with um, the, the direct fuel that would be used. Um, yeah, so, so then I suppose that, that family of, of solutions were all low carbon heating solutions, let's call them. Um, I'm just going to go back here for a second. Um, bear with me here. Yeah. So, you know, what, what the next family that, it, that, that we were talking about here in this is the renewable energy technologies. Um, and again, this is where microgeneration and PV and the like come in. Uh, Okay, I'll stay in this mode just just so to, to keep the flow of the whole thing going. Yeah, so so renewable energy solutions coupled with NZ is a way to go. So the other solutions here that we're going to talk about, or the next family, is really solar photovoltaic, which is PV, which is commonly referred to, and then battery storage also referred to as BES. So I'll give you an overview on, on my thoughts on this. The PV technology, again, is quite simple. It, it's a, a plug and play solution that, that would go on your roof in, in, and it involves solar inverters. But really what's happening is you're converting direct, direct electric and um, DC to AC 
不好。Leave the videos. I think they're causing the issue. Yeah. Sure, my little kid is not busy. <coughs> okay, yeah. So, so that this is right. So, so again, you, the, 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 the the inverters will convert direct electric um, to alternating um, current, which is you know, DC to AC, and then this electricity can either be used in your home or exported back to the grid. Um, we, we're going to hear a lot um, about exporting back to the grid. Indeed, in my own circle, I hear a lot of people um, who are not from the industry commonly talking about, you know, well, what's the feed-in tariff? Uh, how much are you getting back? Um, again, to the uninitiated, and I know many in this group will be initiated in this space, um, the real key here is to use as much of this electricity that you're generating on-site as possible. That, that really is the secret sauce to the, to the, the high performance of this. So if, if, if somebody is at home, and now with working at home, it's actually helped with respect to this as well. So if you can turn on the tumble dryer, different things that are you know, electrically based in the house, um, you'd get more bang for your buck with, with your PV technology. Um, and then looking at the technology themselves, a number of different um, traditional systems that you would have seen here. You've got this monocrystalline, um, which is the oldest or, or the least efficient of them. Um, and then, or sorry, polycrystalline being, being the worst of them, and then monocrystalline being the best of them. So with these, you get different performances. And then we've got this new one, which is the thin film um, performance. And of course, it, it has a, a, an obvious advantage in that it, it's malleable and can be moved and bent and put onto different surfaces accordingly, where the other traditional panels are more um, you know, rigid and, and will require frames and different things. So uh, we'll also see uh, another evolution of this in the form of solar tiles. Uh, again, you know, Tesla were probably one of the most um, advantageous or, or strong in the marketing with, with, with their you know, roof tile solution that, that's sort of out there as a concept and indeed as a product. But there is more and more following with, with those types of technologies and we'll see those I think over the next few years as well. Um, then just a little bit on the inverters, again, no, no deep dive on this um, because it's such a short session, but again, if you have the solar panels, it, it's very common again to have them on a string inverter. And, and if you, the bigger a system you have, you might have a number of different um, string inverters. And again, if you had, say, um, not enough south facing roof space and you needed to you know, take in another elevation of roof space to get the morning light and then the evening light, uh, you would need to, you know, couple them with, with different inverters to get the best performance. And then, then in the next slide here, we have um, the other solution, which is micro inverters, which again is tied to individual panels. And, and that means that you don't get um, a, an issue, say, let's say with overshading. If, if one panel is overshaded, you, you, you still get the performance um, through a micro inverter. It doesn't affect the whole string as it were. It's probably the best way to describe that in layman's terms. Um, then looking at the system monitoring, um, what's really good, and I get screenshots all the time from, from friends in the industry, and, and indeed I'm, I'm hoping to install one of these on my own interfit, um, a couple with the heat pump. So what you do now is, you, because of um, technology and the apps that are out there, you get this constant feedback on performance. And, and this, this is really, really good. Um, for understanding what, you know, the combination of different systems. It, when, when it can be quite complicated, um, having these visual representations and dashboards now really do help explain how they perform. Uh, and so one of the, the, the first steps in, in, in looking at a PP system for me is to understand what your load is in the first place. So if you do have a significant uh, electricity load, then you know PV panels are probably a good way to go. So uh, like all things, it, it's not just to maybe you know reach for something because others are doing it. It's really about assessing your own situation first. Would be um, the approach that we would take here in the college with giving people advice on this. And because we have this micro generation, it does open the door to this whole conversation about off grid versus on grid and and how that might look. Um, so here in Ireland, I think, you know, off-grid um, is, is potentially further away for us in, in some instances. You can see even in this simple diagram, 
um, some of the some of the you know, technology that you might need. You might need a backup generator. You're going to need a significant battery bank, and um, of course your inverter and your micro generation coupled with your home. Um, and then the on grid, it's it's the only difference here is instead of having your backup generator, you're going to have to, you're, you're going to be grid tied anyway for that. But you've also got the meter. But one of the things that's that's coming into play, and indeed I've seen it on nationwide during the week, and um, it's also on another RT show as well, where it, it is starting to show now as well how the EV or the electric car solution um, works really well with this as well with micro generation. So, um, you, you know, <laughs> sounds a bit tongue in cheek, but if you're going to have a battery, one of the best ways to, to utilize your battery is having on four wheels. Um, and and that, that's a good solution going forward as well with, with respect to um, the renewable energy. So, continuing on with, with the, the, the solution, the, 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 this slide sort of doubles up on the previous one. It's just providing a little bit of a more of a context here where, again, off grid, grid tied versus um, completely um, off grid. Um, so, so again, with, with these renewable energies, what, one of the things that's, that's really interesting around the net car, hopefully this generates a bit of discussion as well, um, the Passive House Institute have this very distinct approach to everything where they measure, say, primary energy. Um, so if, if you're talking about here in Northern Ireland, you've Kilroot Power Station up um, just outside Belfast um, in Newton Abbey beside the uh, University of Ulster, Jordanstown. And... Um, it, it, I'm based here in Inniskillen this morning, so if I was to plug in my phone and, and charge here in Inniskillen, and I was to use one kilowatt of electricity, um, I've actually used or consumed one kilowatt. My, my primary energy for that one kilowatt is something to, the, something to the level of about four kilowatts. If I want to cover the actual carbon emissions for that one kilowatt of consumption, um, and, and really, really to give you a sight of what I mean by that is you have to take into account when calculating carbon, say, the, the fuel in the power station and then the distribution and transmission losses for me to use this one kilowatt here and in the skilling. So it took quite a lot of energy to also transport that electricity to here. So, so in that there is significant losses. So um, when the past person should talk about primary energy, their accounting and measurement is, is actually conservative and correct. Um, and, and that's the real figure that you'd want to be surpassing. We have outside here at the Crest Centre a 45 kilowatt um, PV system. And during the first year and second year of operation, I monitored that system. And it was the primary energy figure that I was trying to surpass, not the consumption figure. To, to make a claim about net zero. So um, the, 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 hopefully that, that, that's, that's interesting and does have um, discussion. So again, in, in when looking at battery storage, we were seeing that, you know, it's a solution for generation. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 as we have, you know, say generation, particularly from renewables, it's intermittent. So with batteries, they, they can capture some of that um, energy when it's at its peaks and then you can use it in the troughs. And, and with that, it, it's a very good solution. Then for transmission and distribution, batteries also come into their own in that they help maybe um, stabilize the grid. Um, again, very similar to the top one with generation, there's peaks and troughs on the grid and the batteries come into their own there as well. It sort of flattens out the line as it were. And then at household level, uh, again, um, you, you can see where it, it can be used as well. So if, if you're not at home during the day and you can't optimize using, um, domestic electricity on site and um, then you, that can get stored in your battery and you can use it in the evening which is quite good and then you've heard my point about the electric vehicles as well coming into their own so, th so that's a good overview of where we're at with batteries um, with respect to the various technologies uh, and some of the loads and different things and the cycles of the batteries um, I, I, again th th that's a quite significant area um, but but just, just to give an overview of some of the various systems that are out there or, or materials, and, and some might want to give some thoughts to those. You've got lead, lithium, nickel, and sodium, and each of them would have you know, 
very distinct um, you know, properties and, and important functions. Um, and the lithium ion one is the one that's most suitable and, and common for um, domestic loads. Um, some of the others are, are, are more um, you know, for larger scale situations. So again, I, I hopefully I, I've gone full circle and I've, I've dovetailed well with what's, what has happened last week um, with respect to talking about the energy efficiency and the building fabric and, and the principles in order to achieve that um, from my point of view. Uh, and, and in this project, you know, in the training materials that, and again, we will circulate the link to those. Um, a, a lot of the slides that I'm going through are, are really snippets um, and, and bits that are pulled off that platform for the training materials, it, it is done on a platform that allows self-propelled learning. Um, and hopefully it, it will really be um, the, the tool that all of you may want to you know, look at yourselves and maybe you know, share with others in the industry um, and share with you know, people who are maybe only sort of, sort of beginning to understand some of this space as well. That, that's, that's what that course is pitched at. And it does include you know, the, the various pilots in this project as well. So, uh, it should have some some common items in it, and that uh, you know it, it's the, the people who are very familiar with this would get some nuggets from it. But but really, that it will help people who are just coming to this for the first time get a really good overview before maybe going on a deep dive in particular on one of these things. So there's benefits with all of this in the supply chain, and again, that's the point of the overall project. So that's that's the the presentation. Sorry for the little bit of technical um, blips in the middle of that. I'm not sure what particularly caused that, um, but we're, we're into Q&A now, I hope. Okay, Valerie, thank you very much. Um, at the moment, I don't see any questions in the chat, which is great because I've got lots of questions. <laughs> okay. So the first one, I appreciate that you're, by the way, I, I'd encourage anybody to chip in with questions or else put up your little hand on the, um, you know, the flag, the little yellow hand up, and we'll come straight to you and switch you on. Um, first question, I know you're based in Northern Ireland and that the building regulations between Northern Ireland and the South are slightly different, and your understanding of the building regulations in Northern Ireland is probably better than the South of Ireland, but could you talk a little bit about um, whether you think that the building regulations are adequate for driving us towards where we need to be and if not, what needs to be done, both north and south? Okay, yeah, really, really good question. Most of that preloaded, um, Michael. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I suppose I have quite a unique standpoint, maybe, than, than some in the sector. I, th I think the, the Irish government need to be commended, first of all, for the building regulations. Um, with regards to their thermal properties um, and thermal regulations, we, we, are, we are brilliant. Um, we're right there. The argument to go to something like Passive House in the Republic of Ireland is, is, is makes, makes complete sense, particularly if you're building a new build, um, because our U values are so close to the Passive House recommendations, and indeed in many ways they're 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 there already. Um, where in the south of Ireland we, we we could be a bit better is is that we've got a bit of a not a loophole, um, but we we are allowing you you know the renewable energy to come into the equation. So there is still maybe, um, I, I would like to see a bit more of a focus again on the thermal envelope and getting that completely to a level. And then we talk about the renewable energies. At the moment, there's still a way in which you can um, utilize renewable energy to hit your numbers. Um, so, but I think it's an evolution thing. I think that's where we're going, where we're trending. So uh, again, overall, South Ireland probably gets a gold star. <laughs> um, in, in Northern Ireland, unfortunately, there is still a lag with respect to the, the, the building regulations, particularly in, in, with regards to thermal performance. They're quite a bit behind. So, so for us here in the college, we're, we're, you know, the argument about maybe going to something like Passive House, um, particularly maybe when looking at some of the costs, there's a bigger jump to be made um, with, to get to that standard. So the argument is a little bit different and, and you might want to talk about some of the different you know, angles on, on why passive house might be embraced. You know, you are future proofing and different things. So um, the building regulations have quite a way to go in, in, in Northern Ireland. And, and then 
renewables should not be be talked about I, to, in, 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 to a large degree in Northern Ireland until we're at a level where the thermal performance is optimum, in, in my opinion. So again, you know, that would be putting the cart before the horse in many ways. You're on mute, Michael. Next question again from me, just to give you a little story about two months ago, I was out walking, I live up in Donegal, out in a rural area, talking to one of my neighbours about NZEB and passive housing, and he's at the process of getting planning approval for a new house. So we had a chat for about an hour. He arrived back in my house last Sunday for about two hours to say that he'd been off to talk to his architect and that they were basically saying, all of this passive house NZ stuff isn't really achievable and that he they couldn't put him in touch with a building services engineer who could really tell him anything helpful about either ground source heat pumps. So he was saying, should he persevere or should he just go and build a bog standard house? And it's just something that I've run across before. Is there an issue with designer competencies, both in the North and the South, with architects and building services engineers not having moved fast enough to understand what is on the market and what is possible and feasible. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I, there is, Michael. That, that that's the first thing to acknowledge. Um, but I mean, I think I think there is. Um, oh, in 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 the last five years, there's definitely been a, a market, you know, a, a really noticeable increase in terms of the knowledge and and the amount of people that have embraced training and, and are now probably of a new mindset with respect to some of these things. Um, but again, it takes time. Um, I think that um, the solutions are now more, much, much more common. And there is even, you know, with respect to my views on it, there is more people uh, uh, attuned to that line of thinking now as well. Um, so overall, I think North and South, um, the marketplace is in a good situation. Um, with respect to your friend and that, I, I think, you know, <laughs> It's it's for even for people who are maybe not you know fully au fait with anything. I I would suspect fear is the reason why you know these things are not maybe you know advocated for by some. It's just you know they don't know how to do it. But but I would encourage anybody that maybe knows people like that you, you know to to make the argument to come and engage with some of some of us that do know in the industry because um you know to build a bog standard house for example means you're you've locked yourself in to discomfort and. You know, bad building performance for the duration of that house, and that's a fifty-year decision or a fifty-year consequence of that decision. And then you, you're going to leave yourself open to, you know, the 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 fuel markets and the international disruption that will go with that, and the no doubt increase in costs of that fuel, and then no doubt as well the taxation of that fuel. So. I mean, it, it's a really smart decision to, to go with some of the stuff that we've talked about over these couple of sessions. Okay. Right. Still don't see any questions from the chat. I've got one other one, which is, could you talk a little bit more? You talked about the 45 kilowatt PV system that you'd put into the Crest Centre. And for, for the first two years, you'd been monitoring what the primary consumption was. Could you talk a little bit more about that in detail, about what it showed and whether you think it was cost effective? Yeah, so, so that's an interesting one. So it, 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 I'll come back to the cost effective part in, in a moment. Um, but but at the moment, for example, I'll use another um, example. My own home, which is very, um, you know, applicable to lots of homes, both both north and south. I live in North County Monaghan. It's a 1970s bungalow. I'm about to retrofit it. Uh, I'm at the point of getting quotes from different people. I'm going to go down the road of a heat pump. Um, that heat pump would have an energy manager built into it, which is connected to solar PV on the roof. And, and it will, with the brains of this energy manager, um, you know, optimize itself in real time based on the solar generation on the roof in combination with the heat pump. So, so really, um, those systems um, are, are more and more coming onto the market, but that's, that's the, the leading edge at the moment. But if, if my home was to be, say, 
running running with say a really low heat demand but it had the, the low energy um or it had it was running on electric heating for example and um, the, the consumption figure is one thing that's what i was trying to say in the presentation the consumption figure whatever it may be in kilowatt hours i used the example of charging a phone one kilowatt hour well it's a ratio to to four to get in the the full picture um of of um, primary energy so the primary energy figure if you want to be pure about saying the words net zero then it's the primary energy figure and um, to, to cover the carbon emissions um, it, it's that figure that you want to be surpassing, not the consumption figure. So if you had PV on your roof, for example, and you use, say, in, in a day, 11 kilowatt hours of, of energy, then if you generated 11 um, kilowatts during the day on your PV panels, this is all hypothetical, of course, not really, then that, that, that would be, you, you've covered your consumption figure. You can't say you're net zero at that point. Um, you would have to actually generate 44 kilowatts to cover the primary energy demand and the true emissions figure. So the point I was making is exactly that, uh, and hopefully maybe second time around, that's a little bit clearer. Um, so, so this is, this is um, the crux of the issue when talking about micro-generation and making claims about being net zero, and, and that doesn't even include things like embodied carbon and all of that for, for the overall building as well, which is another conversation in itself. 